and uh, to indicate we are recording. So if you come in late or if you want to review, we have uh, a recorded version of this. We're going to upload it to YouTube as well as our website as we typically do, but we may have additional places where we archive the presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Glenn Thompson, and as you see, and uh, I've been working uh, in a mentoring capacity and teaching coaching capacity with Pacific Trading Academy for uh, just short of 15 years now. I've been trading for 30 plus years um, and uh, you can contact us uh, at, with the information you see on the screen 800-339-8588 is the toll free and you see our website www.pacifictradingacademy.com if you'd like to get more information concerning uh, our programs in general and more precisely uh, what it is that I do in some of my uh, approaches. I want to talk about the bond market and rates. Uh, so the title is Dissection of the Bond Market. If you have questions along the way, uh, again, the area on the control panel on the right side of the screen is for that. Um, I am pretty certain, I always say this, and I guess I talked a few about two weeks ago, and I have a habit of saying that we'll have plenty of time at the end, and then I have a terrible habit of over, you know, being too verbose. So I only have, I think, 10 or 11 slides today, so I am almost, uh, I can bet the ranch on the idea that we can uh, have further discussion time at the conclusion if I can't address your concerns in the, yeah, while we're going through the slides. Um, so, um, oh, one other thing I should mention, if you have an interest in any of our programs, the person you want to ask for is Peter Newman. He handles all the contractual arrangements uh, and marketing and so forth. So, uh, with that note, let's proceed, and I'll give you my latest thoughts. We got short, or I got short, and then the uh, people who follow my advisory signals and so forth. In the bonds in particular, May 1st, uh, about a, when was that, just over a week, uh, 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 yeah, May 1st, we're short from 157.75. We closed yesterday at 156.21 and change, I think. So, uh, timing should always take precedence over price. Uh, this is a slide that um, I, I presented here at the outset to give you a sense of my um, analytical approach and what I uh, place a lot of emphasis on in trying to make the projections that I make and come to the conclusions that I reach. Um, I, I am a technician. Um, when it comes to bonds in particular or interest rates, we're talking about money flows and, and cost of money, essentially. And so there are certainly fundamental um, events and uh, factors that serve as primary movers and catalysts for the uh, interest rate and the cost of money. Uh, I believe at very deep levels or at the deepest level, certain specific time periods of elapse uh, have, are, are correlated with what we see bubbling up on the surface fundamentally uh, and seem you know, to present the more immediate superficial cause and effect. Uh, factors. But again, underlying all of that, I think that are very, very deeply embedded, not only in the bond market or in interest rates, but in all financial freely traded markets, uh, has to do with certain time periods. So I just wanted to kind of present this at the outset to kind of give you a conception for the biggest, uh, the backdrop by which I form my opinions. All right. Uh, whenever you're talking about interest rates or the nominal bond rate, uh, market, um, or the treasuries in particular. And I'm not, yeah, I want to specify, I'm not referring to all bonds, primarily focused in the big picture here with the treasury instruments in the U.S. Uh, money flows towards greatest, and so uh, the cost of money uh, fundamentally uh, is intertwined and is uh, impacted by capital flows. And in general, an overriding guiding pr principle is that money always flows towards the greatest um, uh, area of return, where it perceives it can generate the greatest return or be reinforced and amplified and increased. So that's a guiding fun, kind of fundamental concept and precept that I think about in forming any views and projections and forecasts for the bond market in general. This is a chart that I presented a, a couple of months ago. Uh, I think back in uh, January or February, I can't recall, I did a presentation at the beginning of the year where I presented some of my views concerning outlooks uh, at, in a broad macro sense in terms of where I thought the greatest opportunities would lie. I, pers I thought that there would be a lot of uh, a heightened degree of uh, volatility this year in light of 
uh, technical and fundamental factors. So this is a daily uh, bond, uh, a daily chart of the bond market, which uh, the front month at the time, the March contract. You can see we we're in a low interest rate environment, and the nominal bond price was uh, moving up the ladder, so to speak. This is just a Fibonacci overlay, trying to give me a sense of where I might expect probable degrees of retracement. So again, it reflects inversely the rate structure, the, 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 the velocity of money, essentially. And so this again is at the, I think, in the first part of uh, either end of January or first part of February that I presented this slide. And so that was then. This is now. This brings us to the present. I printed this chart out yesterday. This is the daily chart of the front month, the June contract in the 30-year uh, Treasury bond. And uh, let's see, did I... Oh, I didn't. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of I am bearish the bond market, uh, but there's a qualification, and I'll br I'll bring that out. I'm bearish, assuming certain um, parameters that I projected and do believe will take come into you know will manifest shortly. Assuming that uh, is, is the case, it kind of lends itself or facilitates a particular scenario that I'm projecting for bonds, in particular the nominal bond price. So this is, again, a chart that we printed out just yesterday. Um, and uh, some obvious wave structure. And I, I depend on trend analysis, my timing, which is kind of GAN-oriented and all sorts of time price uh, equivalency models, and then uh, the Elliott wave model, which I fi find to be a very helpful descriptive price action uh, set of ideas. So if we, this is the top to which the market, the previous slide was kind of moving or heading. So this is again is a couple of months ago, the bond, the front month contract, and we headed up to a top. This uh, We hadn't quite reached it at the time I printed this chart out back in February, but here's the top, this top. And so this chart, the chart, the previous slide was kind of right in here somewhere, and then we moved up to this top. Assuming this top price, uh, which came in on, uh, what day was that, January uh, it was January 30th, if I recall, the actual top. Uh, a subsequent slide will end. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was, yeah, this top was January 30th. Um, let's assume that marks the end of an impulsive bullish cycle. Uh, and as such, the, the, the simultaneously the onset of a bear market or a correction, at least. It's one of those two things. So a plausible wave description would be that everything, the initial impulsive move down would be a wave one. We had a correction up to wave two bringing us into uh, what I think everything since this top right here through yesterday is uh, the, uh, the formative stages of what I believe, or kind of maybe midway or maybe a little more than past the midway mark of a third wave. And that's, so if that's, if there's anything to that wave description, that would be reason sufficient, I think, to expect further declines. If you do a Fibonacci projection, as the a next uh, uh, further slide will show, a later slide will show, it brings you down uh, um, to much lower levels. So uh, these two lines are some GAN angle constructions that I've done to kind of give me some uh, further, fill in some dots of information, so to speak. So that's the present picture uh, as observed on a daily chart in the bonds. Let's make sure I just want to check in. Can you guys still hear me? Everything is fine? And you can see? Good, good, great. I want to, I, I apologize for the interruption. A couple of months ago, we had major technical problems, and I went through an entire presentation and got to the end and realized people could not hear anything. So periodically, I may check. All right. So this is the present. Um, this little move up the other day, uh, or yesterday, uh, had a key reversal Thursday. That's bullish. And so that's a little odd. In the If, if everything from this top here uh, designated the end of uh, wave two, the correction, and this, all of this structure from the top here, the end of the bull market cycle, I believe looks very, uh, through wave two, looks very textbook wave structure. And the third, the, everything down to here looks very good as far as a potential third wave. Uh, I was a little caught off guard by this, but this was the, uh, this was the, the fundamental event that the news and the pundits seize upon is the, uh, the jobs report that came out uh, just yesterday or the day, whenever, yeah, yesterday, I guess. And that's what the market seized on. We had some, eh, how do you characterize it? It was a good report, good numbers. Uh, so, you know, good news in general, when you want to start analysis in a very broad sense on the bond market or interest rates, 
good news is bad or good news is bad for the bonds bad news is good for the bonds I'm not quite sure the stock market certainly responded positively to this uh, but in any case the day before we had a key reversal which is in and of itself somewhat price supportive and then we had follow through yesterday into the close into the weekend um, these lines this is my uh, uh, it, relative to the, the first slide where I said timing takes precedence over everything well here's here's this uh, in uh, demonstration in the real world my next projected time target uh, for the bond market is this coming Tuesday as you see and then subsequent to that I've already projected out to the end of June uh, disregard this that's just a that's a vestige of something I should have deleted I don't know what that is oh no I'm sorry sorry that's my I just I don't know what yeah what I was I thinking here this is one this is two this is my hypothetical three in both price time space yeah so it's uh, it, so I have a plausible scenario for uh, this is one two and then the three might correspond with my turning point over here in at the end of June and it might be I put it down here because my actual price target is just about in the area of 140 between 140 and 141 and so uh, let's see where the screen let me get rid of this uh, yeah I kind of put it no not I should have put it a little higher because it's actually right in here as you'll see in a, in a, a couple of slides from now but yeah close enough so that's a hypothetical scenario and that's the scenario to which I'm hewing currently and have the uh, preferred bias of uh, and as evidence where I'm putting my money uh, again we got short a week more a little uh, about a week ago at 157 just under 158 157.75 so we're doing so f uh, so far so good move on this is just uh, an indication the uh, Alan Andrews pitchfork to kind of indicating uh, on an ongoing basis on a running basis let us know if we if we're in uh, moving and uh, positioning in uh, on in sync with the trend these are median lines and you can see we're at the upper median line I am a little suspect and concerned about this powerful move up from the, in the last two days however I'm I'm my concern is mitigated a little bit by let me go back to the previous slide by the idea that we've got a turning point projected theoretically for this coming Tuesday so we're obviously not trading on the weekend so the idea in my head the probable scenario is that we may move up into the middle of next week possibly mark you know given it <clears throat> given or take a plus or minus a few days but assuming this were to operate as a timetable for how I can expect the the rotations of uh, price returns to manifest uh, it kind of gives me a, a at least a plausible potential roadmap and with that I kind of am able to get a sense as to the generic types of information and events and news and uh, uh, that can occur I you know one of the fascinating features of technical analysis when it works and when it's reliable and when it's at its best is that it allows us to kind of uh, reverse not reverse engineer but forecast the fundamentals um, the problem or the challenge of fundamentals is trying to uh, resolve to and come to a net resolution of what it all means uh, I am I always am telling I tell the students I work with and it's a thought that uh, is ever with me and has been since I was about 25 years old when I first got started in this thing um, I am nowhere insightful enough to try and figure out the plethora and multitude of events that can occur in the world and make sense of it uh, individually I can maybe uh, put two and two together but uh, the confluence of all the things that can occur in a world that uh, could in logical ways impact and influence and inform and direct a market's behavior uh, is daunting enough much less when you take into account the collective response of all participants worldwide that are following that market that collective response itself by virtue of orders that are uh, uh, arriving at the market uh, becomes a piece of information a fundamental event um, I I have no concept as to how anyone can, can consistently with any meaningful degree of reliability do that so uh, I'm not an opponent I'm not anti-fundamental I'm not pro technical I believe the best of all approaches is a, is a combining or a looking for alignments between varying forms of information uh, I find it fascinating coming full circle of my point I wanted to make here is that if I 
have confidence in a certain, say, technical picture that a confluence of my timing and trend and uh, Elliott wave analysis indicates, it more or less points me in the direction or, or it, it creates a more of a, uh, uh, a ballpark type of predisposition of expectation as to the type of fundamental factors that will occur. So for example, you know, this week we've got a, a lot of information, uh, scheduled meetings and reports and data flows coming out. We've got the situation in Greece, as an ongoing situation. We've got the ECB um, in Asia, Europe and Asia blocks in general for the last few months have been pushing rates down. That's bond, pr nominal bond price supportive, certainly. Um, we've got uh, some, I think the sentiment number, consumer sentiment or confidence or whatever comes out on Friday. I, I, I don't recall the exact uh, but there's a lot of informational uh, reports, data reports coming out this week that certainly the financial structure and um, sector uh, will respond to and likes uh, and it gives it fuel for the fire, so to speak. Um, so by having confidence in a particular chart view, however, it, whatever it is, it kind of enables me to, uh, with some amount of uh, respectable reliability, predict the general tenor, at least, get in the ballpark of, of, of figuring out or, you know, being prescient in terms of knowing what the reports are going to say, if not specifically, at least in a ballpark type fashion. So I, um, I like doing that. Um, all right. Let's, uh, so that, yeah, the, the pitchfork, I just did it to give you another vantage point. You know, my idea here is as long as we stay governed, as long as this market follows somewhere in this, in this channel, uh, you can see we're up near the upper median line. Uh, to the extent we have some follow through into the first part of the week, again, this vertical line corresponds with my May 12th. Oh, I didn't mean to per I hit, hit that by mistake. My May 12th date, this is the end of uh, June time target. So it's conceivable we could have a little bit of a pullback. Now, let's just back up and see where that might fit. How can that reconcile with theory? Well, Again, start of one, this is the end of one, correction two, and I believe everything from this top right here, the end of correction wave two, the onset of impulse of wave three, which I foresee and project might end up over here at the end of June and down here at, uh, around the 140 price level. If it's an impulsive wave, all of you who are conversant in Elliott know that all impulsive are odd waves should subdivide into five little waves. So this is your one. I should have marked this clearly, but I think you can see it on the screen. This is the internal one of the three. This little blip up the next day, the top would be your correction two. This might, this bottom yes, uh, Thursday would be the three of the five, the internal three of the five. And as such, the, the, re, the unemployment report that came out uh, uh, yesterday, I guess, or whenever it came out, um, is the was the fundamental event that the market sees to push the market up to create a, an internal little fourth wave inside of this third wave. And it also happens to reconcile or dovetail pretty nicely with my time point. You know, so we might so that suggests to me we could more or less plus or minus a day or so here. Again, my idea is that I if I don't see the market stop its movement up being bid up by the middle of this week, vis-a-vis uh, -vis my time point and this wave structure, that would tell me that something's amiss. I am, either I've got it completely wrong or my interpretation is, is not quite consistent with reality. But to the extent I see price behavior, be, you know, in the first part of next week, consistent with this, it tells me that at least there's one theoretical precept that can account and uh, makes, makes enables me to make sense of it. And I can uh, have some confidence as to what is responsible for the price action traced out on the screen. All right. So this is possibly this little blip up and the catalyst or the trigger again was the report came out, the unemployment numbers. Uh, uh, the jobless uh, figures, uh, creating a fourth wave, a little correction in internal fourth within that larger degree third. Uh, assuming that's the case and we find some resistance here, I would expect the fifth of the third to create this bigger move down here. We have a relatively small little third here. By the rule of alternation, there tends to be an inverse relationship between the, in, uh, the, ma the re respective magnitudes of third waves and fifth waves. Having a little third, a smaller than typical third, I might expect a larger than typical fifth, bringing us down to that 140 area, possibly into the end of the June, consistent with this time target that I projected. All right, so that's my most 
uh, favored or preferred or biased uh, uh, scenario for bonds right now. And as such, again, that's why I'm short the bond market. So that's my argument technically. And we'll have to see as events and uh, reports are released if the <clears throat> fundamental if if we see a, a a synchronization of what's going on in the real world with what the confluence of my technical models are suggesting um, as a guide you know I would suggest as long as we stay more or less proximal to this upper median line at, at minimum I would say that uh, I'm still in the game I think the big the, the I should have mentioned this at the outset as a fundamental feature I think what's the drive the fundamental driver of interest rates uh, or rather nominal bond treasury prices treasury uh, instruments is the bet that traders are that the Fed the central bank is going to raise rates uh, so Janet Yellen is a key player in this game right now Janet Yellen and her cronies and uh, in, in particular um, is is I think uh, the the critical, pivotal, fundamental component in the bond game right at the moment and will be for months to come, I, I imagine. Uh, based on her interpretation and the, and the bank's interpretation in general, I think the bond traders are betting, uh, they have placed this major bet on the idea that the Fed at, uh, uh, at some point will raise rates. We've initially, you know, a couple of months, since the beginning of the year, there's been discussion in terms of will we raise rates in, uh, in was it, um, June or September my aunt, I don't know that we're gonna and so the response by the bank has been um, our monet our policy will be f f uh, influenced and determined by data depend it's data dependent and it's going to be formulated as as numbers come out I think appropriately so uh, the qu the big question is to whether or not the short side of the of bonds is going to pay off as a speculative uh, trade or campaign is this particular bet on interest rates? Uh, you can see how much the bond is, uh, the nominal bond prices have declined since this top here uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, through where we are right now, all based on this bet with a low interest rate environment. Imagine what happens if and when uh, we see the uh, beginning of uh, some uh, more hawkish policy and a tightening up and a ramping up of the rates. Um, all right, so. That's the central question. It's a interest rate uh, play, and I, to which, uh, in, in you know, in, the, in a fundamental sense, Janet Yellen holds the cards. Uh, so we'll have to watch her closely. So that is where I, you know, pay particular attention to. She's a key component here in this in this play. I think. All right. Uh, just in case, uh, in terms of getting a sense of how we can expect this internal, what I uh, am characterizing to be an internal fourth wave. Um, uh, Again, these are some probable, these are just your standard FIB retracement levels, 38, 50, 60, 1.8. Anything, we take out 61.8, I then go to 78.6. Uh, that would be atypical or uncharacteristic for an in, any type of fourth wave. Not impossible, but uh, again, given the time and assuming some amount of linear proportionality between the distance potential the market could travel between and, and the time allotted for such. Again, my time target, this vertical line corresponds to this coming Tuesday, May 12th. Um, again, nowhere is it written that market motion and returns and price returns must be linearly related in a, in a Newtonian sense with time, but uh, more or less, uh, that's a starting premise. So this is the framework, uh, technical framework, within which I'm kind of attempting to interpret the price action through the present and uh, attempting any extrapolations forward for the future. So this just gives me, you know, I'll be looking at things like this, uh, especially this coming week, uh, trying to correlate uh, degrees of retracement with events that occur, specifically the uh, financial reports and the numbers that come out, and I know this week is full of them. Um, here, just here in the U.S., we've also got a situation. The other uh, factor you've got situation in Asia, and primarily the ma another major issue is Greece, and their negotiations with the um, the uh, ECB, and um, and ultimately, you know, to what extent they will be. Um, uh, what kind of agreements they can come to in terms of satisfying the IMF and their other creditors. Um, I know that they are running out of time. I think they have a payment that must be made uh, by the third week in May and then the ultimate payment in the second week of June, if I recall the news. But So that's a major factor in terms of what, how that resolves. I believe it will resolve one way or the other. I don't think that we're going to see a uh, jettisoning of Greece from the, uh, from the blo European bloc. 
Uh, I could be wrong, but that's my thought. So one way or the other, that will be resolved. Uh, and so that, in turn, will impact and influence uh, the European bank's uh, monetary policy, which, in turn, is correlated with our central bank here. But ultimately, you know, the final output, let's watch Janet Yellen, will get us a keen sense of what to expect in our bond market here. All right. Uh, let's move on. Uh, this is just the uh, an optimistic, assuming I'm correct with this bearish scenario in bonds, this is just an overlay of a, of a Fibonacci third wave projection that I alluded to in an uh, earlier slide. If this is the start of one up at the top here at the beginning of the first quarter of the year, and this is the end of one, this is correction two, and everything from this top right here is the onset of a wave three of a particular degree, then... Uh, theoretically, in a conservative and very conservatively, this is your this is your 1.618. If you can see that, folks, 1.618 Fibonacci extension of wave one. So this is one run off this pivot point two, and it's nothing for and this, so it brings this into just 140 and a half or just slightly below 140 and a half area. You see that? So that's my theoretical. So there's if one embraces the short side of the of the Treasury 30-year Treasury instrument. There is still, even if one is not already short, there's still tremendous profit uh, return opportunity, I anticipate, given this scenario. And this is just a FIB overlay to indicate um, a projection. Even if we only, let's say we get a shorter than typical uh, third wave, maybe some reason, for some reason, what I'm expecting, even if my analysis is correct structurally, but the actual magnitudes of the internal structure of this third, let's say that final fifth wave that I think could be responsible for the uh, translation of price from where we are right now or wherever we may end up once this little blip up stops and starts to resume resume a resumption of the move down let's say it's let's say it brings us in here uh, getting short from anywhere in the you know this week let's say in any of these levels uh, is still offering tremendous um, decent opportunity I think in terms of percentage return All right so big picture. This is a weekly chart of the bond market I printed out yesterday. This is somewhat, I, I purposely wanted to do this. Let me just see again, any questions as we go, folks? Great, so far so good? Okay, um, here I wanna present a, I wanna play devil's advocate for a moment if I may and present a contraindication, contrary view, an, an alternate viewpoint. Here we've got some textbook, you know, you could put this in a textbook. The bottom here, um, beginning, uh, beginning of uh, January, uh, you know, uh, long-term picture here. This would be a one. This is your correction two. This kind of blasting off here. Obvious uh, long candle in here. That's your three. This is a little sideways fourth wave up to the very top, bringing us more recent. That's your five wave a bull market cycle. Then you have a classic either, and what I'm calling, this is the very same top that the previous daily charts were showing, marking that I believe is the start of a bear market wave one. So this would be the end of one, correction two, bringing us through where we are. The weekly chart doesn't show the, the internal detail. We lose some of the detail. We gain the bigger global uh, uh, perspective. Uh, here's the an obvious alternative, and it fits perfectly with theoretical uh, the, the the attractor of the Elliott wave, the basic five one two three four five ABC. Instead of this being a one two three, it could be an A B C correction, and it would be of the zigzag type. And if that's the case, uh, all bets are off, folks, in terms of my shorting uh, or my short scenario and uh, uh, ex an expectancy for. Uh, further declines or offering down of the nominal price of bonds. Um, if if the if the trade if the short bond if the traders who are short in bonds right now lose the bet, and if the Fed in in you know indefinitely delays a rate hike, then essentially you know which I I can see uh, given the data we're getting mixed at it. We'll get positive numbers, but it's it's not all that positive. And so again, clearly the Fed and her counterparts, uh, Fisher, I think at the New York Fed, the, you know, there are three central bankers here in the U.S. that are primarily responsible and we listen to a lot, but primarily Yellen, if they appropriately are, are, are finalizing and resolving their decisions uh, in a manner that is data dependent, as the data comes out, unless and until we really see, you know, in an effort not to hinder and mitigate against uh, any recovery from the recession, uh, I believe that uh, that could, uh, you know, indefinitely delay a hike. 
and as such, this could that would be an argument for uh, getting out of my shorts, taking profits, or holding off, or essentially going long the bond market. You know, stop and reverse procedure. So I want to point out an alternate view. I don't think that is the case. I think there are going to be further declines. I think uh, we are going to begin to see data reflective of uh, um, that we are. Uh, progressing, albeit slowly, slower than ideally one would have hoped, let's say, out of the recession. Uh, I don't think we're out of the woods. Big picture, I expect, you know, I'm very optimistic. I'm not a doomsdayer. I was telling someone yesterday for the economy at large. Um, I think overall through the remainder of this year, we're going to see a significant new highs in appreciation in the equity sector. Um, and I think this will be te uh, uh, congruent and complementary or concomitant with further nominal uh, declines in bonds, even if we did, uh, ha don't have a rate hike uh, into uh, until the first quarter of, let's say, 2016, or even if we don't see a hike in rates um, in, uh, in, in, for the remainder of this year, I, th I think that will bode well for stocks, but I still think we can, the, the bet is on, and the momentum and the inertia and the trend will follow the follow through for the nominal bond prices for further declines. But I got to be cognizant of what I'm seeing here. A lot of this move down, the, if, whatever, if this is a third wave or if it's a C wave of a correction, if it's, which certainly is a potentially right now, you can see the, mag, the relative magnitudes of this initial, the A and the C are roughly equal. And that spells from a technical vantage point an indication suggesting we're likely more likely to go up and persists, you know, in some substance. Also notice the open interest line, this lavender line, this is indicating that this move down is liquidation. And liquidation tends to be shorter uh, uh, lived than, uh, and not as long lived, uh, also on low volume. So we've got a number of factors. We've got the red line that, you know, I want to present the opposite view here. The commercials are coming off of their net short position. They have just become slightly positive, that, that red line here. So I, it's not as if I'm, uh, uh, you know, the ostrich with the head in the sand, so to speak. Uh, I'm not not paying attention to the other factors that are ostensibly bullish for uh, nominal bond prices. And this is a this is a slide that, in collectively, uh, looks at some factors that I think are could pivotally um, be the evidence or the argument for a bullish scenario in nominal bond in the Treasury bond. So that um, I'm aware of that is the point. Uh, in spite of that awareness. I believe that we're going to begin, I, I think my argument, a primary fundamental uh, factor that interweaves with the technicals, as we'll see, is that we will begin to see some data to that more strongly and consistently indicates that we are moving further and further away from the troubled times of a few years ago. Uh, and as such, the response on all levels, very deep cyclical time and bubbling up to the surface uh, as espoused by the central banker, uh, Ms. Yellen, we will begin to see uh, possibly sooner rather than later uh, a hike. And that would put certainly uh, put pressure on the nominal bond. All right, here's my argument. Uh, if I can move the slide. Oh, well, the, oh, before I get to that, here's uh, just one other uh, just confirmation of the time price uh, alignments and squaring and balancing points. Back, this is the slide, uh, uh, just a repeat of a slide I did back again and again in the beginning of the year. I can't remember if it was January or February. At the time, we were I had predicted a price target of 155. <clears throat> Let's see if this, if I have, can see where we were. Okay, so I, when I presented this, my initial price target overhead was at 155. At the time I printed this chart, it was at 151.28. I don't know if you can see that, but 151. I had an initial price target of 155. The idea of resistance there, if we could break through the, the ultimate target that I projected was 167. I didn't have a corresponding time point for that, but those were two separate zones of overhead projected resistance. Uh, these were some past time time uh, targets, came in very, uh, uh, we hit that on the nail, December 16, we had a January 5, that's that uh, very close to a top, I don't know if it was tradable, and then February 5th. So that was what I had projected uh, back, uh, I guess, either in January or February, these time points and these two price targets of resistance. At the time, we had the market again was at just uh, about 151, just under 152 in price, and I pr uh, projected a little resistance there, and then we would break through ultimately to into the area of 167. So that was then, and this is now. So this is the December 16, let's just see, you can see the overlap 
here, the dovetailing of the two time frames of bringing us from the past to the present, for flow forward in time, as the slide indicates. December 16, let's go back. Here's December 16, we had a top there. January 5 uh, came in maybe a day or so before a top, but again, that was more a top that was in the midst of a uh, still a primary running move up. We had considerable inertia to the upside there. So here we were, December 16. Here is the, I think maybe, here is the top of the January uh, 5th time target projected. I didn't put that, January 5 was my theoretical. It actually came in the next day, right here. And I didn't put that on the slide, I le left that out. So we could see more clearly my subs, and then we had the, uh, oh, uh, go back. This was the uh, the one that had not we had not come to at the time I presented this slide initially a few months ago, a couple months ago. All right, so February 5th, and then so let's, and then so here we are. Uh, we've passed that. The actual top came in uh, a few days before my theoretical. I predicted a, a turning point February 5. It, sir, I'm sure at the time I was thinking, working on an assumption that that turning point would correspond to a top given the trend directionality at that time. On my price target, if you recall from the previous slide, 167, we got very close. We were in the ballpark. The actual top that came in, the actual top came in a few days before at 171.28. So not bad given we had projected that weeks if not months prior to the actual um, uh, event. All right, so here we are. We had a time point and a, uh, a, a near confluence of time and price there, pretty accurate. And you can see the sub, and so I was looking at this. Uh, this is either everything from the top here that ultimately manifested on January 30th is an, either an ABC correction, in which case I, you know, I'd want to be embracing a bullish scenario right about now or soon in the next few weeks, <clears throat> or it, alternatively, you know, it's a bearish scenario that's a one, two, three of a bear market. And I believe that's more probably the scenario. Time will tell. No pun intended. All right, flow forward in time. So here, my next time target um, that I projected happens again to be this coming Tuesday. And then again, further out, I've already projected to the end of June, as you see. So let's see what happens. I also, the, again, the other point to stress my argument or to re-emphasize re the bearish view, I, the argument for this little key reversal and blip up that we've seen and possibly follow through into the middle of this week would be that that would serve to form an internal fourth of this longer term, larger degree wave three, which if I'm correct, I would expect on or about the middle of this week or Tuesday in particular, precisely speaking, to mark a top from which I, we would proceed and resume lower or offer the price down into the end of June, marking the end of this third wave. And that's the opportunity that I'm on board currently, and that's my argument for such. And I would expect to observe uh, and see on an ongoing, you know, incremental basis, release of data and information that would uh, serve to um, be a promulgator of that type of uh, technical view. All right. Here's another argument, again, uh, and I think this wraps it up. This is intermarket assist, and this is where I think we're going to get, you know, the assisting player, if you will, ball player on the court or whatever. Uh, curiously enough, from an intermarket stand, this is a soybean chart. There are, tends to be a correlation, believe it or not, um, those of you who traded for a while probably are aware of this, soybeans and inflation. Having nothing to do, well, superficially, I think there is a, a more deeply a correlation, but uh, soy, bean price, rising bean prices uh, correlate with rising levels of inflation. Falling beans correlate directly with lower inflation. So that being said, without going into too much detail on the specifics, factors, and fundamentals that are impacting into which beans or agri an agricultural market uh, is responding to and is sensitive to, my next projected time point for the soybean market happens to be this Monday, May 11th, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, Monday is the 11th, Tuesday is the 12th. So curious. I, th I find it of interest. I don't know if it's coincidence. I have no, I don't know, but I do find it curious to say the least. I have a, my next time target for the interest rates, bonds, the 30-year treasury in particular, is this coming Tuesday, May 12th, one day Prior, I have a time projection for a completely different sector uh, and different market altogether, the bean market. But if you think about it, due to this intermarket correlation and specifically the relationship that nominal bean prices have with in, in inflation levels, I find this quite interesting to say the least. This piques my curiosity, I always say. So you can see what's been happening 
I have been telling some of the traders and, and student traders and people that I talk to and consult in my mentoring and teaching, um, and who uh, you know, and I generate signals and trades. Uh, a lot of people have been asking me from a seasonal standpoint, what to do with soybeans? Should we be entering into trades? If so, what direction? Well, clearly, uh, this chart doesn't show it, but it shows some of it. Going back at least a year on this chart, the overall overriding trend in uh, soybean prices is clearly down. Uh, we had a major bottom, uh, depending on which particular contract you were looking at, the end of September of last year, first week, October 1st of 2014, right here, and that's marked by that horizontal line, and we kind of have an overarching semicircular kind of double bottom type structure. So I believe we have a trade opportunity in a completely different sector if you're looking at this superficially having nothing to do on the surface with treasury instruments uh, on the surface. but more deeply, if you reflect on it, I th I, there's a critical inner market connection here. Uh, the fact that my theoretical time projection for when I would expect a component or an attribute of the, of the bean market to shift happens to be this Monday, May 11th, and the fact that it's essentially one day prior to my next projected time point for the bond market, this Tuesday, May 12th, essentially a margin of acceptable error. They are one and the same. That's a time cluster. So. I, here's my thought on the bean market from a strategic standpoint. I've been telling traders for the last couple of weeks what to make of this. Given the trend, I've uh, been coming down for more than a year. Uh, I am expecting that possibly this move, this bottom here marked the end of a fifth wave. This was the start of a new generic bull market. This is a correction wave too. My plausible scenario is that assuming we see a reversal on or around the first part of this week consistent with my May 11 time projection, that would mark the onset of a, uh, uh, finding the, mar the market, rather finding support off of which it would mark the on ensuing or the start of the commencing of a wave three. Rising bean prices again, let me repeat, correlate with rising inflation. Could this possibly be a, a leading indicator of some data that's uh, characterizing our economy moving further and further, or the economic U.S. engine heating up. I don't know. I'm just saying it makes sense. It co there, are co there are plausible possible correlations that exist given historic statistical relationships between beans in particular and levels of economic activity within an economy. To the extent we see that, now to be a little more specific, I've told traders if the price of soybeans, for example, stays at current levels as we move into the beginning of next week or uh, goes down and more closely it approximates and tests that support, the long-term support that we saw back in the fall, 2014, depending on its response, if it should get proximal to that support, if, it, if the support holds, that would bolster my bullish view in beans, which in turn would bolster my bearish view in bonds given the correlation I'm specifying at the moment. You see, if we because bean prices rising again have a strong correlation with as a possibly simultaneous and or leading uh, you know preview of coming data that would suggest that the economy is getting in gear or shifting to a higher gear, and as such that would uh, possibly be one trigger to you know for the bank to respond to, which in turn could be a factor in terms of a sooner rather than later, uh, at least making uh, overtures towards a rate hike, which in turn would be a, a major issue uh, uh, or component that would serve to put offering pressure on the nominal treasury price or and the 10-year as well uh, on varying spectrums of the interest rate curve. Uh, so that's a factor I'm looking at very closely as a, co as a correlated intermarket relationship. So again, to the extent we see bean prices drift sideways and or lower into uh, the first part of this week, given a you know plus or minus uh, margin of error, a couple of days here, um, and we don't take this bottom out that, that came in the long-term support zone around the 9:30 area, just below it or so. Uh, that would be very uh, uh, bear, that would be a bearish component uh, through an indirect set of processes for the nominal bonds. All right, so we'll watch and see. On the other hand, if we should be you know by middle of the week or so be if we take out this horizontal line in bean soybean prices that would be that the uh, bullish scenario that you know that the I alluded to a few slides ago that this is going to that this is an ABC correction uh, and then the fact we have a well, not a technically a key reversal week here but almost you had a long range you had a very low tail there you had a close not quite uh, above the previous week's close but almost it was in the upper 
almost upper third of the region. So that's and it, that's an argument for the bullish scenario that we're going to see uh, a rate hike, um, or excuse me, a a uh, a, uh, a softening, excuse me, a, a, may, a delay in rate hike, excuse me, uh, and then we might see uh, uh, bond prices being bid up. So we'll have to wait and see, but I find this very interesting. I thought that would be uh, a final slide to kind of create an additional correlation that I'm paying attention to. I don't, I, I wonder if it's coincidence is my, is my guess. After, you know, for bonds, the, or excuse me, for the uh, soybeans, my, this, this vertical line out here, I've already projected for a next, or uh, the run time, June 16th. This vertical line at here, I should have given the date, but that's in the middle of June, ju oop, June 16th. Let me go back. Uh, to specify that. So this is a relationship um, that from an intermarket standpoint, I've got the technicals, I've got, a, uh, you know, the Fed policy, I'm watching the, the situation in Asia and in Europe, in particular with Greece. The ECB currently is, you know, uh, uh, with easing in terms of trying to um, stimulate things over there. Uh, also very important uh, and related, not immediately, but May 22nd is my next projected time point for oil. Um, I am currently long in oil, uh, but more importantly, beyond that, June 1st, I have a time projection for uh, crude oil in particular. The June 1st data I think, find especially interesting because it's four days prior to the OPEC situate meeting on June 5th. And I think oil prices and the US dollar, all of these and the petrodollar, a lot of these factors ultimately are interconnected to rates and the cost of money and the bond in turn. So uh, that's my argument. Again, folks, I am short. Currently, I'll put, I have put my money, so to speak, where the analysis is, and uh, we are short. If one has not gone short, I would, you know, if you're part of the advisory news uh, signals that we send out, I anticipate more than likely, probably 73, 75% probability, I'll be looking to add to existing shorts by middle, before the end of this coming week, uh, I would say, given an acceptable margin of error, given my time points and price levels that I've projected. Um, but I'm allowing for the possibility, maybe I'm wrong, in which case I, I can see the factors that could move into alignment to support the opposite or contrary uh, scenarios. Um, but if, we, if, our, if we're correct, the profit opportunity is significant. Again, my price target for the 30-year Treasury, the front month and the futures, in the area of 140, even if we only got a fraction of that, it was considerable opportunity for some decent percentage return on an investment. Any questions, folks, before, you know, um, Okay, any questions on anything? We've got, I'm wrapping it up. Uh, I hope you've gotten something out of it. Um, it either, the lack, I normally get a lot of questions or something, either I know that there, I see, I'm not seeing as many people. It, it might be because we changed the time again. We realized that one of my coworkers, Ken, Ken had given, Ken Chow had given a presentation at, at scheduled at nine and we forgot about that. So just a day or two ago, we sent out a notice to indicate anyone who had subscribed for today's presentation that I was uh, going to be speaking on, um, should we had to change, move it up or move it to 10 o'clock Pacific. So maybe some people were thinking, you know, showed up an hour before and didn't find me and thought I, something was happened, but it, yeah, it was a scheduling conflict that we were unaware of until the last moment. Uh, but if you have any questions, again, I've, I uncharacter or atypically have finished prior to the hour. So I'm happy to answer any questions. If not, while I'm waiting for any questions that you might want to formulate, um, uh, let me do, we got to, we have, you know, we always, or not always, but from time to time we offer a raffle. If anyone wants to, um, participate at the end when I sign off there will be an area you can uh, click on and fill out your name and phone number and or um, email so that we can contact you and then put you in on the raffle the prize of which is a, you get a free mentorship for a month uh, normally valued at thirty three hundred dollars you get it for free um, if you have other questions or would like to review we are recording today's presentation again and uh, uh, you can access the website um, for that um, so it's, if you, if you want to, uh, there's a sheet also, uh, I think when I hit the turn off button on the, when I commence the program, you'll see a, a little thing come up on your screen where you can fill in your, your contact information. Again, Peter Newman is the person who handles any relationships that like to, if you'd like to find out more. Okay. Here we got a question. I was just stalling. I was buying time. Hopefully get a question. Let's see. Where is it? Ah, referring to the bond charts. Those were rates. No, 
those were the nominal. That's with what the bond chart. Uh, uh, who is this? Dave. Dave's asking this. Uh, no, what I was sh I was not showing the interest rates. I was showing the actual nominal bond price, the 30-year, the June contract in the 30-year. Uh, the you can assume that the rates are inversely related. More or less, that's the general idea. So indirectly, I'm look I'm thinking about rates. Rates have been for some time now, say, you know, historically low. They have been there's been pressure. So the question has been for you know for months now. When is the when are the when is the bank going to start to reverse that? So on the one hand, you've got concern. If you do it, if you do too much, too quickly, too aggressively, we will stifle in mitigate against the economic recovery get it you know will put us back into some type of recession if on the on the on the one hand on the other hand to the extent you delay we're not addressing uh, longer term issues like debt deficits uh, trillion multi-trillion dollar deficits uh, so it's a fine tightrope walking act that these bank is uh, it, uh, here uh, hewing to essentially but no the direct answer to your question is those charts that uh, I've indicated in the in the slideshow presentation were not actual precise they were not reflecting or showing graphically interest rates they were showing the actual bond prices hopefully that okay I'm not an expert on that topic is uh, something th oh thanks for oh thank you for oh appreciate the question great guys any other questions we've got five more minutes Again, I'm in new territory here. Normally, I go over. This is probably, this is, uh, you know, maybe I should cut it off because I can set a record. This would be the shortest webinar I've ever given, maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. But normally, I tend to be too verbose, so um, hopefully, yeah. Again, we are recording this, so if you have, uh, I'd like to revisit uh, any of this, um, please do. Um, you have to contact uh, the academy, and they would and they would give you directions or a code on how to uh, capture or listen in on any specific webinar, this one in particular, or any others that I've done, or any others that any of my coworkers, other teachers at the academy, have uh, recorded over the years. I've been doing webinars now for I guess three years or so. Prior to that, I've you know I've never had uh, spoken, and uh, so it's a fun and entertaining way to share. Uh, some of the results of my latest research and um, hopefully open up an exchange of information and give you guys a chance for questions if you want and it causes me to uh, probe a little more uh, with a little more perspicuity I guess a little more detail any other questions if not uh, and I realize again normally we had about close to 60 people that had signed up and maybe some of the people showed up at the originally scheduled time at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, unaware of that we had had to change the time due to a scheduling conflict. So I apologize for that. We will in the future make uh, greater attempts to make sure that there are no schedule conflicts. But we did send out uh, uh, notice of that. And then um, I had mentioned just yesterday to the people that set this up internally, can we, is there something we could put at, at it in the, uh, in the, in the room that would notify you of such if you came in at nine o'clock and the, they said technically it wasn't feasible to do so um, that might be why we're not getting as many questions normally I have a bunch of questions anyway well folks we'll wrap it up and uh, I appreciate your attendance for those of you who have been here again remember to fill out if you're interested in the raffle or just want to get more information in terms of my uh, the types of things I do and the programs we offer I'm happy again you, you have the contact information here and then if you want to be specifically contacted, you can uh, present your phone number and or email, and that would enable us uh, getting in contact proactively with you and um, letting you know uh, what we do if you're interested. Um, if not, um, uh, I look forward to future events. I'm not sure. I don't have anything scheduled. I have some other speaking engagements scheduled for other organizations, but probably in the ne next two or three, uh, within the month, I'll probably do another uh, pre webinar on it on some topic that we feel is uh, relevant at the time. But again, um, it's been a pleasure, and I wish you a great weekend and profitable trading. Happy Mother's Day for all the mothers, uh, if there's anyone out there or anyone that you know, obviously, and uh, wish you the best trading going forward. Look forward to speaking to you again in the future.